Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Erland. I work at North Country Community College as the Dean of Student Life and our College Diversity Officer. And tonight we are co-hosting a panel discussion on the election with Paul Smith's College. Uh, and I'm really thrilled that you're all able to be here tonight. Uh, we have an outstanding panel of faculty from both our institutions who I, I will introduce momentarily. Um, but before I do that, I want to mention that we do invite our audience to submit questions either in the chat or in the Q&A, whatever is easiest for you on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do have a couple of prepared questions that we're going to use to get the, the discussion started. Um, but please select or please uh, submit questions to the chat feature or the Q&A feature, whatever is, is easiest. Um, if you do use the chat feature, you can select all panelists and attendees as the recipients um, in order to send that, that question. All right, so I think that takes care of housekeeping. Um, I'd like to introduce each of our panel members. Um, to begin, I'll start with Tom McGrath. Tom is originally from Boston and received his bachelor's in history from UMass Amherst and his PhD from the University of Albany. His main area of study is 19th century American history with a focus on the Civil War era. Tom has been teaching at North Country for 18 years and currently serves as an associate professor and coordinator of our Ticonderoga Campus Learning Assistance Center. In 2015, Tom received the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Adjunct Teaching. Our next panelist is Brian O'Connor. He serves as the Director of Library Services for North Country Community College. And he holds a master's degree in Library and Information Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He holds an additional graduate degree in history from Florida Atlantic University and a PhD studies in history at the University of Connecticut. He serves on the board of trustees for the Saranac Lake Free Library and the Ticonderoga Historical Society. Welcome, Brian. Annie Roshan it was born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, Annie relocated to Peru, New York in 2005 and became an American citizen. French is her native language. However, growing up in a multicultural city and being surrounded by different languages has been a great advantage to her. And she has been studying foreign languages since elementary school. Annie received her CEGEP degree in languages and literature from Champlain College. Um, her bachelor's of arts degree in, spe in specialization in translation from Concordia University and a master's in education in foreign language from SUNY Plattsburgh. Wow, lots of education, Annie. <laughs> Annie also serves in a, as an assistant professor of modern and classical languages at Paul Smith's College and also teaches Latin American studies. She is a New York State certified translator and interpreter and expresses pride in her native heritage. And uh, last but not least, Cami Sheridan is an Associate Professor of Social Sciences at North Country Community College. She has worked at the college since 2000. Currently, she serves as our Disability Specialist, the Department Chair for Social Sciences, and teaches across the curriculums of psychology and sociology. Cami holds her master's degrees in so sociocultural psychology and special education. Welcome panelists. Thank you, Thank you so much. So I'd like to start with Tom um, and as our resident historian. Tom, if you could, um, I'm wondering if you could discuss the political environment of today as it compares to earlier areas in our American history. Absolutely. Um, I know it seems, you know, we're living through this crazy election period uh, but we've been here before. Um, when you look back throughout American history, and when I talk about the modern era, I'm really talking 1830s or so, when the two-party system emerges, where people could kind of pick sides. And uh, the emotion and sometimes passion that these elections evoke, um, this has been a constant. Um, so, and it, we were talking before, um, the idea that people get so excited and passionate about the election process. I think it's 
it's a good sign. You know, that's a sign of, of vibrance and health. Um, the idea of party loyalty. Uh, this is so evident now. Um, it, we can all, this is a good time to talk about this because, uh, uh, you know, party loyalty has sort of overtaken almost like our daily routine. Um, but that is something that has been around uh, for 160 years or so. Uh, not only do people identify with, with parties, but uh, in many cases, it becomes part of their identity. So whether it was, you know, a marching in a Republican parade in the 1850s or wearing a MAGA hat or putting a Harris uh, uh, Biden uh, sign outside of your house, this really becomes um, part of you. And that's really part of how I think uh, people take part in the process. And when you think about it, how much effect does that have on the election? Uh, that's been debated, you know, lawn signs, you see them, but is that really going to change uh, how you think and, and what you think is important? But again, this idea of party identity. Uh, attack ads, we've, especially on the local level, we've just kind of seen them. It seems like every commercial break, it's one attack after, after another. Uh, that is nothing new in American history. The first uh, attack ad was actually against Thomas Jefferson. If you remember the story about having a, 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 a child with a slave, Sally Hemings, that was one of the first major attack ads in history. Uh, Andrew Jackson was a bigamist. Um, Bill Clinton didn't inhale, if you remember that, in 1992. So um, this is something that's been with us as well. Um, what has changed, I think, and this is really when we get to uh, how different things are today, it's the role of the media. And I know, uh, Brian, you might be able to speak to this as well, but uh, there was sort of an unwritten rule. And when I speak of the media, I don't mean the partisan media. I mean, uh, just general coverage of politicians, uh, that you would, you would know things about them, but it was off the table. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in a wheelchair throughout his presidency. Uh, reporters purposely did not film him as he was held up and put on leg braces to get to the podium. Uh, but when they did do a press release, it would be uh, FDR standing in front of the podium. And many people had no idea that he was handicapped. Um, John F. Kennedy, the rumors about him and his affairs. Uh, a lot of the reporters during that time had a good idea of what was going on and they sort of, again, that unwritten code that you didn't discuss that. Um, but I think since about the 1980s and, you know, the advent of 24 hour news channels uh, and entertainment shows like Entertainment Tonight, uh, the media has really gone out of their way to try to dig up dirt, um, not just political dirt, but um, I'm thinking back to like the Gary Hart scandal, first one that comes to mind, of course, Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky, uh, and we know having lived through this, um, the personal attacks on each candidate and the real uh, effort to expose uh, some of their <laughs> uh, not so great traits. So, and I think, one of the things that has really made uh, this election season difficult is uh, the addition of social media as well. Uh, we're just inundated. Uh, there was a way, you know, in the 70s when you had those three channels and you didn't want to watch the news, you could just shut them off. But now it seems like we, we can't get away with, uh, from it, uh, especially when politicians themselves are tweeting out constantly. So um, I see a lot of things that are the same, uh, but I also see uh, some change with the times. So as we live through this period, um, it'll be interesting to look back and see see how how big this really was uh, in the big big uh, the big picture. Thanks, Tom. Um, we have an audience question that I think piggybacks off what you've you've just outlined, um, and and anyone um, on the panel is welcome to answer this. Um, do you think this is the most divided presidential election in history? Um, or can you think of another uh, presidential election that was similarly uh, polarized? Oh, sure. I mean, look at uh, the 2000 election, which had to go to a recount. And, you know, just how I think we can judge it by how close the vote is, because that tells us a couple things. First of all, 
how many people support a candidate and then how many people were, again, passionate enough to get out and, and vote. Um, so we do see a divided nation, but we've been here before. Uh, can I add to this? Yes, um, please. So I agree with you, Tom. Um, I obviously I am not a history specialist, but um, on a diversity perspective, I think that this is by far um, the most divided presidential election because I think a lot of people are finding their voice, which in the past, you know, if we if we look at um, previous president, um, you know. People were not didn't have the social media to um, to voice their opinion. Um, people were not as vocal because they were afraid of retaliation. Um, and with uh, you know the movement that is going this year with um, the racist uh, protests and whatnot, um, I think we're I think this is a big one on a lot of level. I think this one's gonna, gonna make history in the book. Yeah, and I, I hope uh, later tonight we can also talk a little bit about the historic voter turnout um, that, we're, that we're witnessing right now. Um, I believe it's the most expensive, and again, oh, please yeah. don't quote me. I believe it's the most exp expensive election um, that we've ever had. I believe we're at 300 million or something like that, which is sickening. Wow. Um, the next question uh, is for Cami, um, and I'm wondering, Cami, if you could comment on the emotional divide we're all feeling right now, given the need for individuals and communities to move through um, the lack of an outcome of this election at the moment. Um, in a constructive way? How do we build back bridges that may have been burned by opposing political viewpoints? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I know we've all been warned that, you know, we may not have um, the outcome, you know, within 24 to, now we're moving into well over 36 hours since um, Tuesday. And, you know, a lot of people are feeling all sorts of both physiological and psychological angst, right? I mean, it's, it's a true anxiety, jitteriness. Uh, and what I find to be really interesting are the um, paths that people take to, to talk with one another whether it's somebody that, you know, you're at the checkout line with and they're checking out your groceries or it's somebody that you've known for um, many, many years, you know, people are treating this situation with kid gloves. And I say that because to me that demonstrates respect. Uh, there is no question that this uh, current situation um, and, and the build up to it I mean, the hostility, the, the anger, the preconceived ideas, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. You know, we all went into this election with our own moral convictions, right? And um, I can't believe <laughs> that half of the country is in direct opposition of whatever my moral um, conviction is. I know that's not the case. I know that's not the case. And so my... Um, my recommendation, my, what I have to remind myself are a few things. And uh, I, I say this knowing that I myself have to um, temper uh, myself. It's recognizing the commonalities and appreciating the commonalities and knowing that steps that we've taken with regard to these uh, or this election, they've been taken. It's, we've voted. That was our um, that was our job with this election, was to to vote, and this is our time to step back, to allow the process its due, and that's really hard to do for everyone. In the meantime, we can look to our right and our left of our neighbors, and we may see signs, we may not see signs, and they may, you know, throw the hackles up on our back, or we may feel alignment. 
at this point, it's so important for us to take stock in the good and the common good that we share. And so I think it's really important for um, an introspective moment. We have to take care of ourselves because we're not only dealing with the election, we're dealing with a pandemic. And uh, not only <laughs> are we having an election that probably will be like no other, and, and I said that with the Gore um, Bush election, and then I said it with the 2016 election, I'm saying it today. Um, you know, I'm going on the third never again election um, in my short, uh, short number of years um, voting. Yeah, I know I'm only 24, who would have thought? Um, anyways, we have to take care of ourselves. We have a pandemic. Um, our, our bodies are physiologically and psychologically being taxed. And so we have to pay attention um, to ourselves, what our bodies are telling us, you know, how are we feeling? Are, you know, we have this acronym out there called HALT and stands for, are you hungry? Are you angry? Um, do you feel lonely? And are you tired? There are four real, one of them is very physiological, well, two of them, right? You know, um, hunger and tired, you put that combination with me, move away, <laughs> right? It's, uh, um, it, it, it's nothing to be reckoned with. Um, but, you know, those are a couple of things that we can do, right? We can eat. Um, and we should be eating healthy and we can also take a nap. But the, um, the anger and the loneliness, those are other things that during a pandemic, uh, there's a lot to be angry about and there's a lot to feel lonely and isolated. And those are things that, you know, really we have to lean on each other for. And that may be our neighbor um, with a mask on, you know, reaching out. And even if they have the opposing signs in their, in their uh, lawn, you know, throw on that mask and, and talk about the weather. You know, if you're located in the North Country, like I am, um, in Lake Placid, you know, yesterday we woke up with, uh, or two days ago, with a lot of snow. I mean, it was 14 inches here. That's something to talk about. Um, you know, it just kind of epitomized the, the whole event um, for me anyways. But, um, you know, I, I think we have to be aware of the moment and aware of the energies associated and what we have control over. We have voted. We voted. We did, with regard to this election, our job. Now our next job is to take care of each other and that may involve, you know, taking our families for walks in the woods. Again, if you're located in the North Country or in the Adirondacks, you know, and all in the, in the woods. I mean, just looking around, you know, we've got 60 degree days right now and in the sun, we need that serotonin moving into winter, take advantage. Um, we have so much to be grateful for and that includes our democracy. And that includes a democracy that whether we um, are feeling pain or anxiousness, um, you know, whatever it is, um, we, we really need to take care of each other. And that is our neighbors. And that is our neighbors on opposing sides um, because it's, it's not just the radical right and it's not just the radical left. Um, there's a whole bunch that's becoming evident that exists in the middle. Um, and we need to, we need to show empathy. We need to show empathy and also maintain our convictions with the need for celebrating diversity, celebrating what makes this country what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's much bigger than any of us individually. I probably should stop with that at the moment. Um, I would have to uh, thank you, Cami. I really appreciate your comment. Um, I have to say that I'm really proud of the Paul Smith College community because we're face to face right now. So it's another dynamic, right, regarding the elections than being completely remote. Um, the night of the election, um, a lot of faculty and staff came together and um, we had some um, section, I would say, where um, we had color coded, I'm sorry, activities where you could go and do some hearts and crafts and not talk about politics at all. And then we had another section where you could 
you know, go and do another activity and there might be some talk of politics. And then we have another category where definitely there are going to be some, you know, talk about politics. Um, of course, like anywhere where, you know, we have people with different opinions, radical different opinions, but um, so far so good. You know, I think we're, we're following what you said, Cami, and we're, we're being like we are all doing right now, you know, with NCC and PSC together, we're, we're being supportive towards each other, right? And trying to be um, patient and taking care of ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Great points. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that or should I move on to another question? Yeah, I just, um, I was reminded uh, 2000, before the 2016 election, one of my students um, asked, you know, if Donald Trump gets elected, you know, do you think the country will be over? Something like that. And the whole class like laughed. And at that point he had just, I think, announced his candidacy. And I just said, the system is in place. It has worked for this long. The system will work. So I'm not getting political one side or the other, but what Kami just said, you know, you vote and the system kind of plays itself out and uh, just have faith in it. So, but I also think that, you know, these elections exacerbate all these feelings that we might have and just create this tension. It's been especially bad this year because of everything else going on as well. Um, also the social media, you know, before you knew whether a person was a Republican or a Democrat, but then if, if you read their social media and you see what they're posting and you disagree with it, it just it raises it to a new level. So um, I think once you cast your vote and the system does what it's supposed to do, um, I think this will all smooth out, so. Well, Tom, I just wanted to take you back really quick on the social media piece, because um, I, you know, I didn't want to go into Brian's area, but. It is absolutely crucial. The amount of disinformation and damaging information that is going out right now, it, it's not going to help um, any of us and uh, all of us working in an institution of higher education. Um, that is one thing we can do is, um, you know, just drive home the importance of making sure we only pay attention to evidence-based or fact-based information. There's, there's just too much out there that um, it's just poisoning for the mind and the soul. And um, it's, it's not going to move us forward. And, and that is a takeaway for me from the last however long is, um, I haven't been on Facebook since, I don't know, maybe um, four days now, just because I'm realizing um, I'm not growing from it. Thanks. I'm good. Yeah, that, let's let's go to Brian's question because it, it, it's it's very timely. Um, Brian, I I was wondering if you could speak uh, to all of us about the importance of the skill of information literacy and how to recognize bias in the media, um, all the various forms of media, you know, print, online, radio, etc. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's funny you. you what are the Things I'll suggest seem like common sense, but I find myself sliding uh, all the time into my own cocoon. Uh, I remember just an example way back when Reagan was president. He did something I agreed with. And then I said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> How can I do that? Because I was immediately um, always in opposition to anything he would do. And of course, he's uh, certainly not as, uh, not as polarizing as uh, is, is Trump and uh, his opposition have, have uh, what they've given us our climate. But yeah, it, I had an interesting uh, experience recently. My, my Kate, my, well, first off, my wife was pretty much not a news vacuum, but uh, the day after the 2016 election, NPR went off at the house and never went on again. Uh, she simply doesn't want uh, uh, to, to get too wrapped up in it. And she said uh, things like uh, Cammy indicated that. It's, it's in the end, uh, we have to take care of ourselves and it may not really change our personal lives that much. Though she's a full-blown Berniac. Uh, 
but uh, it, it's it's uh, tricky. And uh, recently, I had my uh, cable cut back up here in Saranac Lake, and uh, I quit watching MSNBC. And that was good because uh, it was just underlining and reinforcing everything I already believed on the left. And uh, now I've gotten into the habit of uh, watching uh, BBC and PBS. And uh, I, I feel a little bit calmer, <laughs> not as angry, not as taken. So we, um, I've done presentations on this and shown people uh, like uh, charts indicating all the media, uh, different media outlets, both electronic and print. And you've got to, you've got to try to take a look at it and realize uh, where you are and where you're getting your information. And uh, go ahead if you're a conservative and watch Fox, but do be aware, you know, that there's other things out there in the bias. Or if you're me, do be aware that MSNBC is, <laughs> is definitely confirming my own biases. So it, it's, it's tricky. Um, but again, if you stop and think about some common sense steps you can take, and one of the first things is an old corny statement like consider the source. Um, when you find things that uh, don't have citations, references, or links, uh, you could have a problem. Even Wikipedia warns you about that. Uh, do you have an author? If the thing is anonymous, if somebody's afraid to put their name to it, that's tricky. Um, and uh, you can even uh, investigate that person a bit. Um, and also, on a, say for a website, or uh, you know, look look at their their background. Uh, who put it up? Um, I had a, I had one that I used to use with our students a lot, where um, it was Martin Luther King Jr. And you could see this thing was put out for the kid who had a Black History paper due on Monday morning, you know, Sunday night. And you would put Martin Luther King Jr. into Google. You can't get this website now. It's been taken down. But uh, it was a great teaching moment because uh, one of the ones that came up on the first page said, Martin Luther King Jr., a true historical perspective. And, of course, this was aimed at middle school kids or high school kids with that paper due in the morning. And uh, it said, true history. So you click on it. And there were a lot of hints that there were problems if you look carefully. Um, uh, but one of the things I actually liked about the thing was if you clicked on the bottom, the people that put it up owned up to it who they were. And that was a good thing because uh, you click on that link and it would take you to this kind of chat room of uh, very extreme right wing uh, Nazis, basically. Um, it was kind of scary. And they put this thing up to recruit uh, kids to get them into the movement. So, uh, you have to consider the source. And those guys, at least those guys were honest about who they were. Now the thing has been taken down. Um, also, look at content. Um, if you see spelling and grammatical errors, uh, that's an indication that it's sloppily edited and you have no idea who put it up or if uh, they, they really were careful in checking their own facts, if they didn't check their own spelling or grammar. Um, do you see quotes that you can that you can maybe identify as being incorrectly used or taken out of context? Um, is it so partisan, one side of an argument? You've got to be. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it means that uh, it, it's definitely slanted. And oh, when you see a headline not matching the content, a lot of times this is like clickbait uh, to get you. Uh, to follow it, and, and that can be difficult. Um, and, oh, the real clickbait stuff is a lot of fun, uh, but it's dangerous because people believe it. If the story is completely outrageous, uh, if it's unbelievable, chances are it is. And um, check it out. Check out the, uh, the facts that they, they cite, and uh, you'll know quickly in some cases. Um, I just read something recently uh, that I'd forgotten about, but I should have remembered because when I'd be doing long drives sometimes, uh, particularly when uh, I couldn't get uh, content from NPR that I wanted to hear, or I didn't know the music was boring to me, I would listen to the talk radio. And we forget 
how powerful this is to a lot of people. And particularly, I think a lot of the Trump voters, um, guys, folks like uh, Rush Limbaugh, he's not the only one, uh, Michael Savage. Uh, Left-wing radio didn't last very long, uh, progressive radio. But uh, a lot more people listen to this than you think, and it's pretty powerful. I mean, there is a reason, uh, besides the fact that Limbaugh is pretty much terminally ill, why Trump gave him uh, the Congressional uh, Medal um, of, of, of Freedom. Uh, he, he was a big part. Uh, and uh, you, you listen to a guy like that, and you feel like you're on the inside, and uh, he, he takes you uh, places where um, you maybe don't want to go. But uh, if you can, uh, sometimes it's good to monitor this stuff. It's interesting. Um, at any rate, uh, I, uh, I, I just noticed that the president came on with a uh, uh, little press, press briefing. He hasn't been heard from since the 2.30 in the morning thing. But he's basically, it's a, it's a very confusing message, and perhaps it's meant to be, is that, well, count the good votes, but not the bad ones. I don't, I don't know how we identify those, but... Um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. There's the re recriminations on the right if Trump loses, but they're already starting with recriminations on the left because of the failure to get the blue wave that they anticipated, the failure to kick up, to take the fence. So uh, if, on, on the extremes on both sides, people are going to turn on, on, on themselves as well as on the other side. And uh, it, it's too bad. I, uh, I, I think things will have to calm down, as, if, as some of you have indicated. And um, I'm very happy to, uh, to believe that myself. I, I hope it's true and I hope it happens soon. Um, uh, it, it's gonna be a very odd, uh, we're in a very odd place. I think uh, tomorrow may be very important um, to see where we're going and, and uh, what we can do. And, and like Tom said, it's, we've had it in history uh, in, in the past. You know, the followers of Hamilton and Jefferson went at, at each other and it wasn't always conspiracy. Hamilton did have <laughs> relations with one of his African-American enslaved people. And uh, heck, Hamilton may have been a mixed race himself. Uh, we're not altogether sure one way or the other. They didn't have the internet, but they had gossip networks. And they had highly biased. There was no attempt to even pretend that their news, uh, the newspapers uh, were, were unbiased. And uh, people then would read of the ones that... Uh, probably reinforce their own beliefs or believe the rumors uh, that reinforce their own beliefs. And unfortunately, uh, we, uh, too many Americans do the same and um, we have to check that. It's tough to do it. I, 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 like I said, I've had problems myself and um, it's tricky. But, and like before the Civil War, heck, I mean, well, they already had fights on the uh, fist fights and weapons pulled on, in Congress in the 1790s. But it reached a real fever pitch later before the Civil War, uh, pulling weapons and, and duels that took place. You know, we all know about Hamilton and Burr, but there were many other duels. And most of this stuff was a repetition or a sense of honor that was discredited by comments by others or repeated, men repeated in the press. Um, so, yeah, it's not a new thing. And, we, and I think, uh, as Tom indicated, hey, we survived that. We survived... Uh, uh, in, incredibly partisan bickering and including a bloody civil war and, uh, and, and, and the way people went after, uh, uh, say, FDR and, of course, um, FDR's allies uh, and their anger with the conservative opposition. We've survived that. And I think maybe we went through a little bit of la-la land in the uh, 50s, but it started coming back in the 60s. Uh, and it's just reached a fever pitch, and it's it's unfortunate. But like like he said, I think we will survive it. Let's get past this election and see what happens. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, uh, the right wing may be assuaged, that uh, comforted by the fact that the Republicans will still control the Senate, and maybe the left will be uh, pleased if they can uh, get the say the six more votes for. Uh, for Biden. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the reaction. Like I said, if uh, 
uh, turning inward against each other on either side, but also uh, attacking the others as, uh, as some sort of conspiratorial uh, uh, movement directed to destroy the American way of life, uh, depending on your viewpoint. So um, anyway, uh, if anybody had any questions for me, um, yeah, information literacy is important. Uh, it's a State University of New York. It's one of the most basic uh, goals. I think about one of it's one of six. It's also repeated in the North Country's uh, community college's own goals that we try to do this, and we try to teach it uh, primarily through uh, examining sources for, say, a research paper. Uh, I wish we'd do more of it. Um, uh, it some of our departments are, I think, better than others. Uh, I, I'd have to compliment uh, Cami and Tom and Kelly Rodriguez and their predecessors like uh, Bill Price for insisting on serious research and evaluating sources. I wish we did more of that at the college, and I wish the American people did more of it. Um, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Brian. Um, I. I want to uh, jump to a question for Annie next, and, and then we'll have some time for some of the questions that have come in through the audience. Um, and, and panelists can expand on other, other thoughts that are, I'm sure, swirling around. Um, Annie, I'm wondering if you could speak about what this election could mean for um, policy, uh, in particular immigration policy moving forward. And, what some of the impacts might be on our country's economic development. Um, so first of all, um, as I mentioned before, and you mentioned in the bio, I am an immigrant myself. Um, I came to the United States in 2005, became a citizen in 2014. So this is my second time voting. So um, I take um, the right to vote as a privilege, a duty, and an honor. Um, I'm sorry, I have a macaw. I have a bird and he's screaming right now. So please accept my apologies. Um, so before we get into immigration a little bit, um, I would like to point out a couple of um, diversity inclusive statistics if you're okay with me. So regardless of who's going to win, um, I, we have to look at the positive side. We have a momentum going, right? We have, we're having some discussion that we didn't have back in 2016 or the previous years with everything that happened um, this year. So we had a couple of firsts this year. Um, I feel like I'm in the Hunger Games. Um, in New York State, right, we have District 15 and District 17. Um, we have two firsts, two black men, Democrats, that have been elected. And um, the, the first openly gay black men to be elected into the Congress. So that's huge, you know, that's, that's the wheels are turning, right? Sarah McBride is set to become the first transgender state senator in the US in Delaware. That's a first as well. And we also have, I believe, Oklahoma who elected the first non-binary candidate and Kansas has elected their first trans person of color. So if you look back at the history, I mean, this is phenomenal, right? So that means that people are having more uh, of an open mind. People are starting to, to think outside the box, right? People are willing to accept change. People are willing to be more inclusive. Um, they are, there are 126 women of color running for Congress this year. Um, so far, and like I said, don't quote the number because I haven't checked in the last couple of hours, but we have 44 women that have won, 70 that have lost, and 20 that are still undecided. So that's huge. So let's go to um, the immigration. So the United States is the largest country um, that uh, has immigrants coming in. So after that, we have China, we have Saudi Arabia, Philippines, Mexico, and India. But other than that, we're one of the biggest country that has immigrants. Um, I'm gonna ask you this question. 
How many of you have an iPhone, right? Right? So this iPhone, um, my granddaughter put stickers in the back. This iPhone helps me every day um, with my students, my work schedule, right? And this is because someone named Steve Jobs came up with apples, correct? Steve is a son of an immigrant from Syria. Google, let's talk about Google. How many of you uses Google, right? Google, again, the founder of Google emigrated to the United States when he was six years old from Russia. Um, if we look at Nobel Prizes, one third of immigrants, um, one third of people who win the Nobel Prize are immigrants. So people have this um, perception, I'm not saying everybody, but people have this perception that immigrants equal um, bad, right? Immigrants equal illegal. Immigrants equal, I'm going to steal your job, correct? We still have this mentality. And that's not, that's not the, the truth. You know, those are not the facts. Of course, like everything else in life, we have some things that are um, immigrants that are illegal, correct? But I think people don't understand that when you come here to the United States, um, either in the legal way or the illegal way, it is extremely difficult. I came here the legal way, please rest assured. Um, and I, um, it was very expensive, very stressful. Um, it was a long process, humiliating at times. Um, I didn't expect to encounter, you know, racism, um, especially in this region. And, um, you know, so I'm very proud to be an American citizen and I'm proud to be voting, right? So let's talk about the economy. Um, it is, so Trump, um, we all know his policies about DACA, right? The dreamers. So Trump wants to stop um, the DACA, the dreamers. Um, Trump wants to stop the lottery um, green card. Have you ever heard of that? Right? So the lottery green card, he wants to stop that. Um, we are a country that is made out of immigrants, right? And um, what makes the beauty of this country is that we're all diverse in one way or another. So um, yes, we need to have rules in place, but I'm not going to, I don't want to start a political debate in the sense of, um, I don't want to divide people or whatnot, but I really believe that if Trump stays as a president, it's going to have a uh, very negative impact on the economy of this country and in regards to immigration. We need immigrants to keep this country running. Um, like I said, one out of four businesses are owned by immigrants. Um, I mean, you know, like everything else, again, um, nothing is perfect. Our system is not perfect. Um, and we have to come together and find solutions to work together and make this a better place. Um, but definitely if we, I mean, just look at, we all live in the North country. If you go to an apple orchard, how many workers from Jamaica or do you see, correct? Right, they're not here to take um, US citizens job. They're here temporarily. And um, I know for a fact that um, in Peru, New York, um, Florence Orchard tried to hire, um, you know, American citizen to work in their orchard and people won't, they don't want to do the job, right? So definitely, um, I'm looking forward to see what the next couple of days are going to bring. Uh, I'm following the immigration policies um, very closely. 
Um, and I believe in the faith of this country. I believe in the faith of our students, our people. And I, I'm hoping that there's gonna, this momentum is going to keep on going and that we're going to have a more inclusive mind um, from now on. Thanks, Annie. Does anyone else want to uh, comment uh, on? Good, um, good timing. I had a student today. You know, of course, we're working totally remotely. Um, and the student had an argumentative essay, and they were taking the stand that immigration is a good thing. And so I started to help them out. And I, uh, I found this one. Uh, it was basically a reprint of a pamphlet online. And, and Google it, Annie. It's very good. Uh, top 10 myths about immigration. Top and 10 what? Sorry. Top, top 10 myths. Okay. About immigration. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you, uh, it'll, it'll probably come up. Um, it was very informative and it really underlined uh, a lot of the points that you just made. Um, it's, it, it's pretty, pretty wild when you think about, uh, I'm a, my grand, you know, I have grandparents, immigrants, so it's not that, it's not that long ago for me. Um, but uh, let me see if this thing comes up um, about immigration. I'll send it to you if, uh, if it doesn't come up easily, because I sent it off to the student already to do, uh, look at it. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, let me just see if I Thank find it easy. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, we can come back to that if you can find it. Mm -hmm. um, we got a question from the audience for Tom. Uh, given your background in history, Tom, could you speak to the Electoral College? Is this an outdated and antiquated way of selecting a president? Would there ever be a politi political will to abolish it? Uh, I think the fact that we're still waiting on <laughs> the election results two days later kind of answers that question. The, the idea behind the Electoral College was that the founders and rightly so, uh, didn't trust the people to make decisions and to elect their leaders. They were afraid that if it was a straight democracy, you know, if they elected the wrong person, then the country would just fail. So uh, the system has been around forever. It's caused problems and it's very confusing when you look at it. Um, there actually has been discussion about um, changing the system. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if this election kind of moves that discussion along. So, yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, interesting. I, it also makes me think about um, the magnitude of voter turnout that we're seeing. Um, uh, I don't know if, if anyone else has seen some of the, um, the articles and, and maps that, are, that the media is, is sharing, uh, but just comparing this year's turnout to past year um, uh, elections, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on the level of engagement we're seeing and what that might mean for, uh, for our country um, at all levels of government. I think um, personally, like we mentioned earlier, social media is a big factor, right? Um, it's a tool that can be used, pro I mean, if used properly can be very successful. Um, Personally, I believe that some of our leaders should not have the right to Twitter, but, you know, we'll put that aside for now. <laughs> um, but what I'm trying to say is that um, I think we have more engagement because, again, this year with everything that's going on, the pandemic, right? So people are now being affected um, either because of health care issues um, lack of access to um, PPE, right? Um, so people now, they, they, they want to say their opinion. Um, everything that has, again, let's go back to immigration. Let's go back to um, the, the current political atmosphere in this country in regards to other ethnicities or people, Black and people of color people have a voice, they want to be heard, they want to they wanna have a say in it. 
um, this generation is is more active and more um, empowered, I guess. So um, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Like I said, big momentum going happening. Kim, if I could yeah. jump in on that, I I I agree wholeheartedly. But I and I also think it's. And Brian, you spoke to the idea of confirmation bias um, with regard to social media and news platforms, uh, talk radio, I think, um, specifically, or, or you know, talk programs. But you know, recognizing what you know, confirmation bias really is, right? I mean, it's an error in thinking. It's a systematic error in thinking that, in fact, sways um, individuals' judgments and decision making, and a. A great example um, is QAnon and the, uh, the tentacles that this um, conspiracy theory uh, has, has on you know, many, many people and I am sure swayed them with regard to um, their, their energy at the polls. Um, and you know, when confirmation bias sets in, it is, you know, you have to take a chisel to it. It, um, you know, it, it really is the beginning of uh, the solidification of those in groups and out groups. And, you know, once we really feel we've got our echo chamber of an in group, um, it is so hard to, you know, become exogenous and look out into those out groups and find that, um, that commonality. And so disinformation is, and will always be in this era of social media and instant information, regardless of who decides they're going to be the provider of that information. Uh, Brian, you said it um, brilliantly. We have got, to, and that's our job as educators. And for students who are listening, this is our job. It's not to tell you what to think, but how to think, how to find that information. Uh, because none of us, none of us have a leg to stand on if it is based on disinformation. And so confirmation bias, we all have to be wary of um, and check our sources regardless of the you know, authoritative power that we believe they, they hold. Tammy, um, I, I'm glad you say this because I was gonna say the exact same thing. It is our job as educator to, um, like you said, you know, to, to teach ourselves, to teach our students, to learn and unlearn, to have an open mind, to, th to learn how to think critically and outside the box, um, to work as a uh, community and as a society. That's the only way we're gonna be able to, um, you know, make this, this work. Excellent, all right, we have one final question tonight. Um, and it's a great one to end on a, on a high note. What gives each of you hope for our system? Wow, um, I'll start if that's okay. Um, what gives me hope? What I just said earlier, that we now have people that are openly gay that are being elected, that people of color are being elected that transgender are being elected, that people have a choice and that um, we're getting more inclusive regarding of people's skin color, belief, gender orientation. Um, this, I have hope and I have faith. I wanna believe it. Thank you, Annie, anyone else? I can I could answer that. Um, if you look throughout world history, you realize, and maybe a lot of us don't think of it this way, how unprecedented it is to have people elect a leader for a period of time, and then have that leader be replaced without assassination, revolution, war. Uh, that is one of the things that makes this country so unique. And the fact that we just had such a massive turnout, regardless of what side you're on, um, that system is working. So it's worked this long. So let's just keep it going. It's up to us. We got this. <laughs>
I found hope uh, last Friday when I went to early vote in Lewis, New York. And uh, I, I walked in and it was nine in the morning and uh, I was greeted by seven women who I assume were, if not my age, um, older. And I was greeted with smiles. And I knew that this was not their first rodeo, but they hadn't lost hope. And they believed in the system and um, it brought tears to my eyes as I, I cry all the time anyways, but I, <laughs> when, I, when I thanked them for doing what they did and I thought, well, um, my lesson from this is how do I pay it forward? And uh, I was never much into politics prior and instead of being part of the peanut gallery, I'm hoping in the future I can, um, I can get my feet wet um, and maybe help. So there's my hope. Thanks, Cammie. Brian, would you like the last word? Oh, I don't know. They, I, I went in in person. My wife was afraid I'd leave uh, where I'm registered and slip up here to Saranac Lake without voting. So she drug me out to show up at 7 a.m. And it was exciting to see that many people in a small town uh, voting. It went very smoothly. And like Cammie said, they were, it was like they were having fun, the poll workers. And that was, that was hopeful. It, uh, it made me feel good. Maybe I'm, I'm just, I just can't believe people don't vote. It's too bad. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I think that's a wrap for this evening. Uh, thank you panelists very, very much for your time and sharing your knowledge and perspectives. Uh, thank you to our audience. Uh, for your questions and uh, your attention. Um, and we, uh, we hope to ha keep dialogues going on both our campuses. Uh, we are in this together. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye. Everybody, you. this was great. I appreciate Bye. it. Me too. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Kim. No problem. Thank you.